The other day, I was on my cell phone, and I was snapping, scrolling, swiping, DMing, texting, tweeting, and liking, and I thought, this is what life on our mobile devices is like. So let me ask you, how many of you today have a mobile device or cell phone within your reach? If you do, raise your hand. Yes, look around. That's on nearly every hand is up. And that is a reflection of our world today. Five billion people have a mobile device. And to put that into context, three quarters of the human race have one of these. So it's not so much that we have a mobile device, but it's probably that we're on them a little too much. I know I feel that way, and I see it in the lives of my college students who are so tethered to the social media on their phones. And I see it in my own home with my five young kids who love their devices. So what if I told you you could change the trajectory of your life, improve your brain chemistry, and have better relationships? Would you like to be more present in your interactions, more focused at work, and overall more effective? If the answer is yes, then here's our challenge. We need to take our phones, put them down, and look up. Now, I know that looking up from our phones is not easy. So I have three challenges and concepts for you today to help you reduce your screen time and reclaim your life. The first one of these, I think you can relate to if you've ever left your phone somewhere, right? This happened to me uh, not too long ago. I went to my children's elementary school to volunteer, and I got in the parking lot, and I didn't have my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere. I felt panicked. I felt angst. I had this um, just a drift feeling, and I thought if I could just get to a phone, I could call my husband, and maybe on his way to work, he could drop it off. So I walked in to the front office, and I said, can I use your phone? And the receptionist smiled, and she said, sure, right over there, and she pointed to this phone. A relic. How many of you used one of these phones? It's like been 20 years And she said, go ahead and call him. And I thought, how? How? I don't even remember. I mean, this is a cord. You can't walk around. There's no swiping. You actually have to push the numbers down. And I am not proud to say that it took me three times for it to even connect to my husband. Listen, you can even ask Siri, and she doesn't even know how this thing works, okay? So uh, thankfully, I reached my husband, and he was able to drop my phone off on his way, and I was tethered back into my existence. Now that's a silly example, but it gave me pause. I thought, why would I let something like that give me such physical consequences? So I brought it up with my students later. I said, what other consequences do our cell phones bring? And their list was long. They said, headaches, eye strain, tech neck, hunchback, smartphone pinky, carpal tunnel, laziness, the stress, anxiety. And one student said, oh, and you can even trip and fall when you're not looking. And another student said, yes, I actually made a public service announcement video about this. And I said, well, let's see it. And she pulled up her phone and she she showed us this video. Take a look. You get the idea. And I hope that none of that has ever happened to you. Hopefully not. But the truth is, people do get hurt all the time when they're on their mobile devices. Not only when they're walking, but when we're driving. You are 50% more likely to get in a crash when you're driving with your phone than drivers who do not. So what compels us so much that we won't look up from our phones when we are walking or driving 
perhaps it's the apps. And that means the apps that we have on our phones are designed to keep us looking down at them. App designers at Stanford University go to labs that teach them neuroscience. And that neuroscience shows them the ways to the pathways to pleasure in our brain, to the deepest parts of our brainstem. That's pretty incredible. One researcher calls it brain hacking, which is disturbing, quite honestly. He also said that the apps on our phones are designed to keep us looking down as if we were playing a slot machine. So if you've ever been in a casino, you've seen a slot machine. Okay? And what do you do? You pull the handle and you see what you've won. And he said our phones are just like that, that every time we pick it up, we see what we've won. So we pull the handle. What do we get? A notification. Pull the handle, a like. Pull the handle, a friend request. Pull the handle, your snap streak's intact. Pull the handle, oh, ding, 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 jackpot. You got a comment. Yes, we love our comments, don't we? But that's his claim that we crave our apps like we would get a prize every time we look at our phones. And so our eyes are big business. And that's where we're going to start today. We're going to talk about our first key, and that is to focus on eye contact. Now, I teach a class called Nonverbal Communication. And in my class, we always have a unit on the significance of eye behavior, because we know eye contact is really important. And I teach them about mutual gaze. Okay, that's our reciprocal eye contact when you're looking at another person in the eyes. And we know this is so important because we have sayings like, the eyes are the window to the soul. Yes. Um, when we look at one of our textbooks, it says, making eye contact with another person may very well be the single most important act of our communication. I was talking to a physician and he said that the minute babies are born, they use facial imprinting through their eye contact with their parents, and it gives them their safety and their security, and they know that their brain um, is developing as it should. It's incredibly important. But then there's the other side of it, non-reciprocal eye contact or non-reciprocal gaze, and we've all been here, right, when you're trying to talk to somebody and they're on their phone, Or maybe you're talking to a friend, and every time their phone beeps or dings or buzzes, their gaze is consistently away. Well, there's a new word for this, and it's called fubbing. So when you're snubbing someone on your phone, they've combined those words and call it fubbing. I kid you not. And I can tell you that we had a lot of fubbing in our home when my husband played Clash of the Clans. Okay, Uh, if there had been one more loot, war, or team challenge when he played Clash of the Clans, there would have been a major clash in our own clan. Okay, I'm telling you, I missed his mutual gaze because those eye contact experiences, they actually have those better pathways to pleasure in our brain. Now we're going to talk about um, this idea of fasting from our devices. It is so important not only to have eye contact, but to take extended time away from your phones. And so you might be asking, you want me to apply an ancient tradition to my modern device? Absolutely yes. I often assign a media deprivation assignment to my students. Simple. 24 hours, no screens. And then they answer some reflection questions about their experience. Some students do great. But the majority quit. And they pick up their phones. They can't do it. And so they have to answer some really hard questions about the control that their phone has in their life. Sometimes when my students feel like they're on their social too much, they say, I'm fasting from my social media. And they're trying to break that hold that it has, um, that those app designers want for their $31 billion of ad revenues that social media brings in. 
so when we fast from our mobile device, um, I thought about it, about, you know, the fact that every, nearly every major religion has some sort of deprivation practice. During Ramadan, Muslims often forsake food and water during daylight hours. Buddhist monks and nuns often forsake evening meals. Jesus set an example for Christians by fasting for 40 days. And religion aside, there's a huge trend of intermittent fasting. And they, the theory is if you take some time away and don't eat at certain hours, that replenishes your body. It brings healthy back to your body. And I can't help but think, if we fast from our phones, wouldn't we get those same healthy benefits for our brain? One Catholic monk told the BBC that fasting is important for the mind and the body because the body will crave what it expects. He didn't have to mention neuroscience because he knows the human heart. But those app designers, they know. They want you craving those notifications and likes and products, whatever it may be. App developers want that craving, and the best way to get away from it is through fasting. But here's the thing. Fasting alone is not enough. You cannot replace something with nothing. It doesn't work. And I was challenged by this in my own home. Uh, When I was pregnant with twins, I decided to buy each of my sons an iPad. So I bought three iPads because I knew that I was going to need all the help I could get when I had two newborn babies. The boys loved it. And I'll be honest, it really helped me cope in a really difficult time in my life. But I knew deep down that they were probably on their devices too much. And I've seen that research. We all know it's bad for kids' brains. And so when that iOS screen time update came out, I was so excited. I was like, this is my answer. And so I told the kids, I'm like, hey, we're going to have age-appropriate apps, and we're going to have time limits, and I'm going to get it all set up tonight. And you know if you've ever done this, this is not going to go well for me, right? Okay. So the next morning, they got up, and they had their iPads. I made breakfast. And at the end of their breakfast, this was the screen they were looking at. Time limit. You're done. Nine o'clock in the morning. They were, they were shocked. They were mad. And I was beside myself. I didn't know how I was going to take care of them all day long. I mean, how did parents ever parent without a mobile device. I don't ever know. It was going to be a revolt. I knew it. So listen, I didn't think I could do it. I almost gave up and turned it off. But then something happened that gave me the resolve that I needed. You see, my six-year-old son, he loves to imitate his old brother. And so when, when the older brother's away, he'll put on the brother's gaming headset, you know, the headphones and the microphone, and usually he just walks around with it. But this day he had the controller, and um, I figured out that he kind of made his way into an open forum on the game. And I heard him talking, and he said, I'm six years old. And then he said, oh, I live in San Diego. And then he said, what's my address? My little boy was seconds from telling a stranger our home address. It's not a leap for me to think that he had been stalked online. Shaking and scared, I told him that that same stranger danger that exists outside when we're playing at the park in the streets exists inside in our living rooms when we're on the internet. So now I knew it was my job, not only to protect their brain development, but their physical safety. Here's the thing. I couldn't do it alone. It was too hard. And so our final key is to fast with friends. That same monk I mentioned earlier, he said that fasting works best in community. 
And he's so right. Uh, My husband got on board and my mom and my kids, and we talk about our mobile device use and our device-free days. I'm talking to my friends and my colleagues. One mom said when she gets home, she hands her device to her kids and they hide it until bedtime. So she's not tempted to go check her phone or answer a work email. She wants to be fully present in their lives. And that's what works for them. And so I just want to ask you, what might work for you as you think about these ideas and fasting from this advice? We want to create those better pathways to pleasure in our brainstem and not be at the mercy of what an app developer thinks we want to see or buy. Can you do the 24-hour challenge? Maybe you just need to put your phone on the charger from sundown to sunup. What can you do to win back the mutual gaze of your favorite people. I know for me, the number one thing was turning off all notifications. That really changed my life. It reminded me of what Gene Twenge said, our phones should be a tool we use, not a tool that uses us. And by having no notifications coming at me, it's become the tool in its rightful place in my life. I haven't missed out on anything, amazingly enough. So I wanted you to think about that. And when you have a good idea, I'd like you to join me in putting your phone down and look up. Thank you.